Okay, so now we'll talk about the frontiers of physics, the current um, best thing. Look at this, the galaxy here shooting these jets, the black hole at the center of that galaxy shooting these massive jets out into space. Combination image of visible light and x-ray uh, together. So we're going to talk about cosmology and how that relates to particle physics that we just talked about. General relativity and trying to unify gravity into uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, string theory, which is garbage. Just kidding. Uh, dark matter and uh, uh, closure, and then uh, complex systems a, a bit, um, superconductors, that we call them room temperature superconductors, um, and some other questions that we need to know. So uh, this is a really great picture, cluster of galaxies. Every point of light in here is an entire galaxy. I wish they had a little bit higher resolution image than this. Um, excuse me, but um, the best, this is... Just a tremendous image. If you hold your pinky out at arm's length, go ahead and do it now. Point it up to the sky. I was doing that. I just dropped my pencil. Hold your pinky up at uh, arm's length, and the area covered by your fingernail will contain one million galaxies. One million galaxies on the sky in that finger that we could observe uh, with a telescope. Um, and so... Uh, uh, that's cosmology is the study of the history and evolution of the universe. Um, the, this picture is just tremendous because until 1924, we did not know that other galaxies existed. We thought the Milky Way might be the only thing. And Edwin Hubble observed Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest galaxy, which is the size of six full moons on the sky. It's just too faint to see. Um, he realized that that galaxy is outside of our own galaxy by measuring variable stars in it, which have a, uh, a, a known luminosity relationship. And so uh, by looking at the dimness, he could tell that these uh, uh, um, the stars were not in our own galaxy. They were millions of light years away, two million light years away. So uh, um, anyway, so cosmology and particle physics is talking about the history and evolution of the universe. And in order to understand that, you need to understand particle physics. So they kind of work together. Um, these are galaxies. This is a barred spiral galaxy. Um, beautiful galaxy. These are galaxies are usually hundreds of thousands of light years across, which means this part of the galaxy, it takes 100,000 years for the light from that part of it to reach a star over here. Um, so that's weird. Um, and this is the Milky Way galaxy at night. That's our own galaxy. This is what our galaxy would look like if we had a selfie stick long enough to see it. Um, what we're learning is that a galaxy is, has a disk and a bulge, and then this area here is called the halo, and the halo is where all the dark matter is. These are globular clusters. These are the oldest stars in the known universe. They formed f before our galaxy did, um, and the galaxy formed out of, uh, the dwarf galaxies that combined, uh, to form us. Um, but this this halo here is where dark matter is, so keep that in mind. It's this big sphere around the galaxy. Um, this is Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest neighbor. Again, six full moons on the sky. Uh, this is one of the furthest galaxies we've ever seen. 13.2 um, billion light years away, 13.3 billion light years away. Um, that means we're seeing it as it was 13 billion years ago, one of the earliest galaxies. We notice that they're smaller than they are today, so that means um, galaxies began smaller and then they merged into larger galaxies until you get the big ones that we see today. Um, Hubble noticed that um, the further away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. And when he started plotting those on uh, a graph, he realized, he noticed this relationship that literally the further it was, the faster away it was moving uh, from us. And so the, t the implication being that the universe is expanding, that um, these galaxies were closer to us um, at a time a long time ago. And if you just take the slope of this line, um, that's called the Hubble constant. Um, the Hubble constant is uh, has units of kilometers per second uh, per mega uh, parsec or mega light year, depending on the. I mean, it's like sixty eight kilometers per second per mega parsec, which is a different unit or in this case, 20 kilometers per second per uh, mega light year. So then um, the uh, Hubble constant, since it's got this um, time component in there, 
can actually tell you the age of the universe and you get about 14 billion years just from the Hubble constant. Uh, so the idea is that the galaxies are moving away from each other. Um, and this was the prediction. Um, all right, so then, okay, the Hubble constant gives a 14 billion year um, lifetime of the universe since it's since those galaxies were right on top of each other, okay, well, what what happened at that point? So we call that point the Big Bang. Um, there was no Big Bang. Um, it wasn't a big explosion. You can think of the universe as being very hot and very dense a long time ago, and it's been cooling off ever since. So it's been about 14 billion years since it was as hot and dense as the hottest and densest things we can create in the universe. And that's called the Big Bang. That was hypothesized in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. But it wasn't until the prediction of the, the Big Bang, something called the Cosmic Microwave Background, was accidentally discovered in 1964 that the Big Bang Theory actually got attention because there was experimental evidence supporting one of its predictions. And so the Cosmic Background Radiation is, um, if you think about... Um, uh, as we look into space, we're looking back in time. So I'm here, I look out into space, light from this point takes a while to get to me. Light from this point takes a while to get to me. Light from this point takes a while to get me. The further I go, the longer it takes for that light to reach me. And you can imagine, if I keep looking out and looking out, there's going to be a point where I see the edge of the beginning of time, the edge of the universe, the oldest light possible to see. That light is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And that is light that is so redshifted um, because of the expansion of the universe and the time it's traveled and its recession velocity that it is shifted from visible light into microwaves. So you can only detect it with the radio in your car when you're tuned to the wrong station and you hear <laughs> that's the cosmic microwave background or some percentage of it. Um, it's a black body spectrum. When you when you measure that cosmic background radiation and you plot it, you get a black body, exactly as predicted by the Big Bang model. Um, and uh, um, so that was the first evidence of the Big Bang as being an actual thing and having um, a real uh, point. So we don't think of the Big Bang necessarily as the beginning of you know everything. It, we think of it as a moment in the history of our universe. Um, and that uh, leads to all the cool stuff. So um, the problem that we have today trying to explain this is if there was a Big Bang and if it was E equals MC squared, then we would get equal amounts of matter and antimatter because that's what we do every time we create energy in our accelerator. Um, so why is there more matter than antimatter? That's a question. Um, we think that there is a asymmetry in B physics um, B quark physics that the universe actually prefers matter over antimatter in just one quark sector, and that is enough to create the asymmetry uh, that we see today. It's possible. We're working on that question. Um, the cosmic background radiation, if you look at it, has this distribution, this black body distribution. These are higher temperature photons, these are lower temperature photons, this, these are the most average photons. Uh, right in the middle. They actually come from different parts of the sky. The hot, hottest photons come from these bright areas. The coldest photons come from these areas. Uh, it turns out that the hot spots are where galaxies ended up forming, and the cold spots are where these large voids in our uh, universe uh, showed up. So um, the Planck experiment, which is making these pictures of the baby pictures of the universe, show us this um, take really detailed pictures of the cosmic background radiation for studying the initial uh, light from the uh, afterglow of the Big Bang. So the history of the universe thus far is recently um, galaxies and stuff uh, the last several billion years. We can understand the physics pretty well to um, about this period of time. Um, beyond that, 10, about 10 to the minus 35 seconds, and before that, um, our physics breaks down and we don't have an idea. So if we imagine that the universe, when we talk about the Big Bang, if we imagine it emerging pure energy from a, a point, not a point, but um, if all of the energy, if the energy density was infinite, basically, and then it's been cooling off ever since, um, then we can 
uh, get to about 10 to the minus 35 seconds after what would have been that point um, that we think of as the beginning of our universe. Um, but that's quite um, uh, speculative at this point um, to understand the physics before that because since we don't know how this physics work works, we can't talk really about any of that um, before that time. But we can confidently talk about everything after that um, because uh, we can see it, we can make observations, we can do those experiments, we can see how it all works. So we're still working on this part of it, but we're close. I mean, this is 10 to the minus 35 seconds after, you know, the Big Bang or whatever. So that's um, pretty shortly after that we, uh, our physics break down. So we're pretty close. We're trying to get there. Um, so general relativity and quantum gravity, one of the issues you probably heard about that we're trying to solve too is the dark matter, dark energy, black hole center, what's going on there, that type of stuff. That's because general relativity treats space and time as ge geometrical, uh, it's a geometrical um, theory that says space and time are, you know, uh, related and energy warps space and time and whatever. It's, it's called a classical field theory. Um, it's, it's a simple field theory. It's not a quantum field theory, which has quantized uh, uh, structures. So we can quantize gravity. We can quantize general relativity in a bunch of different ways, but there's no way to test any of the theories. And that's the problem um, that we're running into. Um, we cannot test our theories of gravity and relativity and quantum relativity because um, we can't go to the center of a black hole and see what happens. We can't create the universe and see what happens at those initial things. So until we can get the data uh, to back up any of the theories, um, we basically cannot get um, a, a theory of quantum gravity. So like I said, there's a bunch of, um, a bunch of ideas and hypotheses about what it could be, including string theory, um, but we can't uh, answer that. So uh, general relativity says that light falls, um, and light falls uh, because of the curvature of uh, space itself. So the sun, for example, um, creates a dimple in space-time, so the star's light, instead of going off that way, as it starts to travel, it curves and gets bent by the sun and bent towards us. Um, this was the first evidence of Einstein's theory, was the star's positions were shifted behind the sun during a solar eclipse that Arthur Eddington um, studied and found to be true, which is kind of amazing. Um, this is called Einstein's Cross. There's a dense object, there's a star behind it, and we're seeing four copies of the same star uh, because of this gravitational lensing effect, uh, because gravity is being warped, uh, is warping the, the light path and light is following the, the curved uh, whatever path. Um, a black hole is a uh, collapsed star, a uh, high mass star when it dies. It collapses so violently that it uh, leaves behind a black hole, uh, either a black hole or a neutron star. And uh, the black holes, we don't know what they are. We know they're collapsed stars, but um, their their gravity is so strong that light orbits the black hole, so you can't see it because the light doesn't have a chance to escape, which is kind of cool. Um, but we don't know what... We don't have a theory of quantum gravity yet, so we can't explain what's going on at a black hole. Um, Stephen Hawking uh, was became famous because he was able to show that black holes actually radiate energy back out. They evaporate. They don't last forever, even if they uh, do live for, you know, a hundred trillion years or something before they uh, evaporate. Um, there's no warm holes or time travel. That's all garbage. Um, the shortest time scale is called the Planck time, which is similar to the Planck length. Um, uh, quantum gravity needs to happen, but there really is no way to study it yet that we can find. We can't create a, a, a experiment that can do that. We'll see. Superstring theory is the has been the theory to explain everything since the 1980s. Uh, <laughs> so far, it has not explained anything. It's made zero predictions and has had zero experimental evidence backing it up and um, it's been a problem. Very smart people are working on it, and 
people are worried that they're wasting their time. So uh, um, it's been a, a point of controversy for the last 20 years um, because all of this hype uh, resulted in nothing. Okay, so uh, dark matter is um, a hypothetical particle that is responsible for the formation of galaxies. Without dark matter, we don't get galaxies. So um, we need to... Uh, we need to figure out what dark matter is, and there's a lot of experiments looking for it now, um, but that's the main thing, is that um, the curvature of the universe, it's flat overall, we need dark matter to explain that, we need dark matter to explain the orbits of the stars, they're, they're orbiting too quickly around the center of the galaxy, um, they're so far out, they should be slowing down, um, and the, uh, um, just the, uh, formation of the galaxies themselves, um, you can't get them without, uh, without dark matter forming first, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, this is sort of the smoking gun for dark matter. This is called the, the bullet cluster, where they, you see a lot of x-rays coming from this, which indicates visible matter. This blue-pink area is where dark matter is, based on gravitational lensing. So most of the matter is here, the gravitational lensing is uh, um, the warping of space is being uh, is extreme here um, and less so extreme here. But if you look at it with a telescope, the, all the visible matter is there, and this purple stuff is the inferred dark matter based on the um, uh, gravitational lensing, which is how we indirectly measure it. <laughs> Excuse me, a little, a little smack. Okay, um, two options for uh, uh, dark matter are called wimps and machos. Machos are massive compact halo objects. So I talked about the galaxy is here and the halo is out here. Well, maybe that halo is filled with a lot of dark stuff we can't see. Black holes. Massive, because they have to be massive in order to uh, have that much mass to explain the mass of the galaxy, and compact because we can't see them, so they better be black holes or something, and loads of them. Um, those are called machos. So far, we don't really see them. So, there's only one object remaining that machos could be. It could be uh, uh, primordial black holes from the formation of the um, universe, and they'd have to be 10 to 30 times the mass of the sun in order not to be seen by our telescopes, um, or their effects to be seen by our telescopes. So we're looking for those. Um, the, it's not uh, white dwarfs, it's not brown dwarfs, it's not uh, other types of small planets that are, don't, you know, or, or dim stars that we can't see. So far it's not that. Um, but there's definitely needs to be some mass, we just don't know in what form. Um, the other thing are called WIMPs, and WIMPs are just weakly, inter winter, e weakly interacting massive particles, and WIMPs um, are, we, there's muons and neutrinos going through you right now, and the fact that they're not affecting you in any way, um, in physics speak, we call that weakly interacting, because it's not doing anything to you. Um, so there's a lot of ideas for what, um, so the WIMPs are the most probable candidate right now. Personally, I'm holding out for um, this, the tiny black holes. But um, if it is a particle, we will see it. Um, we're looking for it. There's a bunch of experiments trying to find it right now um, to explain what uh, dark matter is. WIMPs. Okay, um, we're not going to really talk about complexity and chaos, but it's cool. Um, these fractals and uh, just the way all this stuff. You can't predict, you know, these chaotic systems. You can only on averages um, estimate things. Um, so there's a, a field of chaos that... Excuse me, like when you're putting dye into a river and you want to see where it goes and all that stuff. Okay, superconductors are um, a special form of matter when you... Um, when you reach superconducting, the electrons have no resistance, so you can transmit electricity or do other things uh, with very good efficiency and almost no energy loss. Uh, so that's called superconducting. Um, MRIs use superconductors because it uses way less power. 
um, to keep the machines running. The LHC's magnets are superconductors. The issue is superconductor only happens at um, uh, very low temperatures. So for example, the LHC magnets are kept at 1.9 uh, Kelvin, which is colder than outer space. Outer space, the cosmic background radiation is actually 2.7 Kelvin on average. So the LHC beam magnets are, are cooled to 1.9 Kelvin um, in order to be superconducting. So that's a challenge because now you have to do superconducting um, and uh, you need super cool stuff to do that. So um, room temperature superconducting or superconductors um, is a big deal. And if you can get a uh, superconductor that works at a uh, regular temperature, it would be amazing because now MRI machines don't need to have liquid, you know, helium or whatever to keep them cold. Um, so that's a big deal is trying to find these and trying to understand the structure of the atoms that uh, allow you to operate that. Okay, so um, the questions that we want to ask, is the universe open or closed? Right now we are pretty sure it's an open universe and what that means is it will expand forever. Okay, so we have a flat universe that's um, going to expand forever. That's what we ex uh, expect so far from our universe. What is dark matter? Definitely there. We see its effects, but we don't know what it is. It could be a regular matter. We don't think so. It could be a new type of matter. That's what we think. But until we see some hard evidence, it's all just uh, whatever. Um, how do galaxies form? We think that um, you need dark matter in order to get the galaxies to form. Um, and that's how they evolve so quickly. Um, so that's what we think, is that dark matter is the seed for all the galaxies. Um, what is the nature of the of black holes? We really want to know what they are and what they're doing inside the event horizon um, and the better data we get on uh, the event horizon telescope the more we can get closer to answering those questions. But it's going to be a long time before we can figure out what is actually inside of a black hole. Um, quasars, uh, what is the mechanism for energy output? So quasi-stellar radio objects or quasi-stellar radio sources these are um, black holes with an accretion disk, and uh, so that's what um, um, we think a quasar is. It's just a black hole with an accretion disk, and what that means is like a black hole with rings like Saturn, and its magnetic fields can accelerate particles to high energies. Um, gamma ray bursts, GRBs, come from uh, supernovas exploding. Um, so five and six have been answered since this textbook was written. Um, in the last few years, which is kind of cool. Um, we're going to skip that. And um, yeah, are quarks and leptons fundamental? We're pretty sure they are. Um, why do leptons have integral charge while quarks have fractional charge? This is very interesting. Um, why are there three families? Why not four? Why not five? Um, are all the forces equal under certain circumstances? So if we go to high enough energies, will the strong force unify with the other ones? Um, or do they stay separate? Are there other forces maybe when we get closer to that? Um, the proton, um, does it ever decay radioactively? At this point, so far, we've never seen one decay. That's kind of a big deal. Um, that puts limits on certain theories. Are there magnetic monopoles? No, I can tell you that for sure. Um, and uh, there's no magnetic charge. Uh, do neutrinos have mass? They definitely do. Um, and they do oscillate between each other, and this is a hot topic in physics. Dune is being built at Fermilab and in a mine in SURF to study this. And then um, when you get up to um, high periodic table elements, what's going on up, up in that region. Okay, so that's uh, cosmology in a nutshell. Bye.